This is the StoryWorks Roundtable, where we have conversations about craft. Because becoming a successful author begins with writing a great story. Hello, and welcome to this week's StoryWorks Roundtable. Today, Robert and I are excited to be joined by award-winning novelist Beth Barney. Beth writes magical tales of romance, mystery, and adventure that empower women and girls to be the heroes of their own lives. She is the award-winning author of Henrietta the Dragon Slayer, the acclaimed paranormal romance author of the Touchstone series, and is proud to release her newest novels, science fiction mysteries about Janie McAllister, space station investigator, the first book in the series, Into the Black is a Page Turner Awards finalist, and as a result, won an audiobook publishing contract. She has also written books for writers, including Plan Your Novel Like a Pro, co-written with her husband, thriller writer Ezra Barney. In addition to being an author, Beth is also a teacher, master NLP practitioner, and certified creativity coach for writers, and runs Barony School of Fiction, a full suite of courses designed to help genre fiction writers experience clarity and get writing so they can revise and proudly publish their novels to the delight of their readers. Well, Welcome, Beth. I can tell you have a lot in common with Robert and me, so we're <laughs> excited to uh, get you at the round table. Yay! Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. It is our pleasure. Today we are going to talk about revising for publication. So what is the distinction to be made between revising generally and doing a round of revision expressly for publication? Yeah, I love this question. Um, I would say, um, let's start with revising for publication. Uh, when you know you're going to either turn your book into your publisher or publish it yourself, I myself am independently published, uh, you know you are making your final decisions. And that can be really, really scary because you're locking in the story. It's no more, could it be this or could it be that? But it's, it's you're making those final decisions and hopefully you're adding all the pieces that make this a compelling read. The sensory details, is the motivation for the character clear? Do I really have all my logical movements of the story clear? Um, is this going to be unput downable? It, you know, so now you're crafting for that you know, reader who's gonna read late into the night, who's gonna tell their friends about your book. Um, it's very different than, say, maybe in the early stages of revision, you're like, oh, I just got to clean up the typos so I can read this darn thing. <laughs> or, you know, handing it to your critique partners and like, does this make sense? And getting some feedback about the story or, or revising for um, making sure certain things are correct. But really, when we revise for the final revision, I personally am juggling a lot of balls in the air because I am at this place where I really need to make sure everything fits together really, really well. I've done a lot of spot editing, but I haven't really asked the big question and I've actually, frankly, avoided some of the harder questions like, why does she do that? Or why does that villain choose to hook up with that villain? And, you know, and part of my process personally is I often don't know until I'm ready to make those final decisions. I have to do a lot of brainstorming. I have to do a lot of backstory writing. And then I make some of these final decisions because it feels like things are still kind of moving around while I'm in the earlier stages. I'm exploring what I wrote. I'm getting responses from early readers and critique partners kind of helping me shape what I wrote. Their questions help me notice what's missing. Mm -hmm. And then I sit down and, and when I feel like I have the foundational pieces um, in front of me that are all the holes, then I answer all of that. Then I put it together and then I'm really the buck stops here. You know, I'm the one sitting down going, okay, does this work? Does this work? And I'm no, I'm using myself as a barometer. Like if I have my attention wander off the page, <laughs> like happened to me yesterday, I'm like, all right, the critique partner was right. I really got to cut those three paragraphs. <laughs> so I got to really deal with that very strong question. Like what makes this a compelling read? And that's mm -hmm. my kind of my touchstone in terms of 
or my North Star, my way of figuring out if the book is really ready. It's like the ego has been set aside and I'm really thinking about the reader. Mm-hmm. I, I like this idea because it, you know, you often hear about, well, the last step is, you know, a full proofread, <laughs> which of course everybody would do, but you're right that sometimes the pressure of the deadline can mean that the logistics of production tend to take priority over is this actually art that's going to, that, that I'm proud of that I would like to go out into the world. How do you um, step back from being so close to the work? You know, do, I mean, for example, do you take a break? The, the, the good old Stephen King advice of, you know, yeah, yeah, put it in the drawer for six months. No one does that. You know, it's, <laughs> come on. <laughs> um, yeah, so how, how, do you, how do you distance yourself so you, so you do see it as a, maybe more as a reader? Actually, I do take a break from the yeah. book. Um, yeah. I do. I really, really do. You need to have mental distance. You need to look right, at your yeah. work yeah. as a, wow, a fascinating puzzle without your ego all caught up. I like to be far enough away from the book that I actually don't remember writing the first draft. I know yeah, yeah. I wrote the first draft, but I don't actually remember it. And and um, and I want to say that I do have someone who goes over and make my. I hire. I've hired someone who will look at the book and correct all the typos yeah. and the stupid grammar and the stupid mostly punctuation and the weird things that spell check and grammar check won't catch. So I have that built into my system. Um, I personally rely on someone for that. Um, so I do put the book aside, um, and that's why I'm working on multiple projects at a time, and that's why I wrote this current series. Uh, I wrote four manuscripts in seven months, and then I started the kind of the lightweight revisions on book one, yeah. and I took th- three to six months on each book. So by the time I did all four lightweight revisions, now we're into year gosh, I can't even remember now, year three. And um, that sounds about right, because last year is when I started the final revisions um, for book one. And by the time I started final revisions for book one, I hadn't seen it in probably a year. Right, and same okay, with yeah. each book. Okay. So I kind of, I did this on purpose. It was kind of an experiment than writing a series. <laughs> yeah. Which, mm-hmm. uh, quickly, versus the first series, Henrietta the Dragon Slayer, I wrote three books in 13 years. <laughs> <laughs> which is cool. they were my, you, my series. and yeah. you've got less linearity that way as well haven't you so you've got this rolling production line which means that you can dip in and out of each of each episode of the series and do more foreshadowing and you know fix more continuity issues and all that exciting stuff that we all love in in a series yeah although i am finalizing each book one at a time yeah um, so there's, I can't go back to book one now and fix anything because books Ooh, one are too much. <laughs> yeah, they're locked in, they're public. I mean, I can do whatever I want. I'm yeah. indie, but, um, <laughs> but I, I need, like you were saying, I need the pressure of the deadline to make these hard decisions and to really kind of coach myself into, this is it. You're, you're squirreling away. You're walking away from this hard decision. And then I'm like, okay, in this hour, you're going to make this one hard decision and you're going to lock this in. Um, and it could mm-hmm. be about world building. It could be about someone's backstory. It could be that that really deep understanding of why someone is doing something. So, so at this stage of revising for publication or revising for the reader, you are still making single choices that could have a ripple effect throughout the entire series if it's about world building or motivation. But you've also already had... Uh, peers or critique partners or, you know, other people give you feedback on it. So will they be the last eyes on your manuscript other than, you know, your copy editor or proofreader? At this point, once you make these decisions and do this round of revision, are you done with external feedback? I'm done. I'm done with external feedback. Mm -hmm. I do have to say I really stress about the first chapter. In fact, I have been working on book three, first chapter for five weeks. <laughs> I really uh-huh. stress about the chapter. It's agonizing because so much is getting locked in. And I've had critique partners look at it, another batch of critique partners. I haven't had my husband. He, he looks at my work as well. I haven't had him look at it. Um, I need to do that. Um, but I really lock it in. And so, and once I get that locked in, everything starts to speed up. 
Mm-hmm. But that's sure. it. after I'm confident about chapter one, I'm like, that's it. I, I got it now. I don't need anyone else to look at this work. Because part of the people, part of the feedback I've already gotten is some from some of my fans who are in this little group of beta readers for me. And they're like, I loved it. And so I know it's good <laughs> enough already, actually. Mm-hmm. But still, I'm not 100% satisfied. So there's that kind of like a perfectionism streak in me, but I have to be so certain. I can't just be good enough. I have to be really certain. And that takes time. There's a lot of like unconscious mental processing happening. Right. That's why it's taken so long. <laughs> oh, so interesting. To drill down a bit on that then, it sounds, the way you express it sounds quite intuitive. What sort of criteria do you have for then saying, well, that's better than good enough, but I'm not stuck on perfection, which as we know, it tends to be the enemy of published art. Yeah, I, I think uh, my, I know when it's good enough, when I'm excited and I'm drawn into the story. Right. That's right. really the barometer, because I'm an avid reader, like all yeah. writers, hopefully, yeah. and, and I can tell when something's not working, just from kind of the body, it's very kinesthetic for me. And if I notice my attention is wandering, I mean, it could be that I'm hungry or, <laughs> yeah. or I need to take a walk, yeah. but most, but I can tell if it's that or it's like, mm, something here is flat. It's like the air went out of the balloon. Eh, okay. <laughs> I, really, I, I really some- like this because I think this is something that, and it's why when I, when I do revision, I will put it on, the, on a Kindle, I'll print it out or I'll find a different device other than sitting in front of my computer because it's too reminiscent of, of being analytical. Um, and, and, yeah, and we all know that it's, editing can end up being quite analytical. Um, and what you're starting to do is it sounds like a, a, a mismatch, a, a mash of, of sort of editing whilst checking into your feelings, which is, yeah, I like the kinesthetic approach because that's ultimately why we read. We read for escapism. And escapism ultimately is only escapism if it ends in something kinesthetic. <laughs> Otherwise, Absolutely. it's just whatever, you know. Um, so, so I like the idea that we can encourage authors to get out of their head and more into their sensations. Um, and it reminds me of Rachel Aaron's two to ten K book, where she says she, she she stopped writing scenes if she didn't if she wasn't excited by them. So even in first draft. So, you know, oh, this is really boring. I'm, I'm finding this a drudgery. So she just stop it, just chuck it out. So, well, if I'm not excited yeah. about writing it, what's the chances of anyone being excited about reading it? And you're sort of at the back end of that where you're reflecting on, on it and say, well, this just lost me here or I wandered off or I thought, mm, I need a coffee or, you know, <laughs> okay, why didn't that not grip me? I want people to be staying up late at night, you know, page turning, as you say. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I like it. I do like that idea of uh, checking to the specific. Are there, do you have specific kinesthetics that are warning signs to you? Do you, you know, being an NLP practitioner, do you, are there things that you check in? The best storytellers move their readers, whether to laughter, tears, or some other point on the spectrum of human emotion, in order to write emotionally evocative, sensory rich, compelling narratives. We must mine our wellspring of personal experiences using the storyteller's first set of tools, memory, emotion, body. This live workshop launches in January, but it is open for enrollment now. In this four-week workshop, we will meet over Zoom to explore our own first tools in a safe, supportive, small group. Whether you want to have readers in stitches over the best rom-com in print, or get them weeping over your tragic heroine's epic fate, you'll come away with the know-how to transform your critical story moments into powerfully memorable scenes. I hope you will come explore your memory, your emotions, and your body, your physical experiences as a powerful resource for creating narrative. I would love to see you in this workshop. You can sign up now at storyworksfiction.com. Um, well, the kinesthetic is kind of a whole body experience, so right. I'm not really keyed into 
specifics, but I, um, I can kind of tell maybe the breathing is the first thing I notice yep. where I kind of feel like, I, that's why I guess I use the b balloon metaphor. Like I feel deflated, like, right. you know, Eeyore comes to mind, like, mm. um, <laughs> Because there's also that part of me is like, I want this to work. How come it's not working? So I quickly go to that kind of sad place. Um, and um, I'm also, I guess it's kind of kinesthetic, but also auditory. Like for me, when the story is really working, there's a rhythm, there's kind of a song, there's kind of some kind of music. And I've thought a mm -hmm. lot about what the music associated with this book, with this whole series is. And I've come up with some right. specific songs. and. And also I listen to music when I edit. And if if the if the prose itself isn't kind of singing, then I'm also that deflated feeling. So there's that auditory quality. Um so got rhythm and tempo playing in there as well. That's nice. Yeah, I like that yeah. too. Yeah. And um it's challenging. Uh I guess edgy is also kind of a word that I notice I key into. Like if the work doesn't feel a little bit edgy and it's so the music for me is kind of a, a syncopated jazz kind of a, a cross between kind of latin and and kind of a fast a train standard yeah. jazz song you know <laughs> but a little bit edgy a little bit on a syncopated african latin rhythm and if it's not doesn't have that feeling to me and doesn't have that edge then I, it's not working like it's almost like i want the reader to kind of be have the sense of that music in the background, like without knowing, you know? So I'm that whole atmosphere and, and I'm very, um, I'm very visual too at the same time. Like these were conceived of like episodes of a, you know, CSI in space is my, is my high concept pitch. And it's like, if they're not getting that jazz in the background, if they're not getting that rush, that edge, then uh, yeah, something's wrong. <laughs> so I've got all these little cues working for me, all nice. kind of, without having to work at, I just have to be receptive. Mm -hmm. um, well, but that's yeah. the key, isn't it? Being, knowing what to pay attention to, definitely. Mm -hmm. Given how much, uh, how many cues you're receiving and working with at this stage in the final revision, I'm curious what the first draft and the second draft and even the third draft are like. Are you, are you, uh, as tuned in in those drafts or are they more just like get bones down put meat on bones like how how do your different stages uh compare to each other oh that's such a wonderful question <laughs> each stage yeah kind of has its requirements and i know what each stage generally needs and of course for me this right now is the heart the final revisions is the hardest stage um but for first draft um so i have this whole curriculum plan your novel like a pro and I use it, it came out of my own needs. So I'm very, that's a very fun process for me. And I can do the planning process usually just in one day now, even though I recommend beginners do it over a period of a month. And so um, I, that's really easy. And I just kind of let myself be led by my own prompts that I've created. And then, um, then when it comes time to write the first draft, um, I write actually on my phone um, using um, Scrivener, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen next time I write a first draft. We'll see what's going on <laughs> in the world, but going to cafes, mm -hmm. <laughs> I go to a cafe generally, and I can write 500 to 2,000 words a day, depending. And then I know for a fact that my um, beginning process is kind of slow, and then it ramps up, and then kind of boop, speeds up pretty much to the end, although sometimes at the end it drops off again in terms of word count. So, um, uh, and I know that I can write a first draft in four to six weeks, eight weeks if it's a longer book. Um, mm -hmm. And I just let myself fit it into my day. I write best right after lunch. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm that kind of writer. And um, so I build that into my work day. And um, it's very, like I, kind of just sit down and do the work it's yeah. really I've done it so many times now 16 books written it's like okay it's, it's very playful space mm -hmm. and I often go off my my sort of outline I, I'm a planter or plotter or kind of <laughs> I, I do like planning but not too much mm -hmm. <laughs> enough. so I know the end goal I usually because I'm writing murder mysteries I know the setup and then after that I kind of 
um, make a bunch of guesses as to what my my detective is going to do. And I try and put people in head to head kind of situations and play with that and just populate my subconscious with lots of ideas. And then when I sit down to write, I'm like, oh, that was an interesting idea, but I'm going to go in this direction, <laughs> you know, uh-huh. so I just play. Uh, and I let that be the bones of the story. That's 90 percent of what's going to be in the final draft. Um, and then when it comes to first level revisions, um, I don't know what it's going to be like next time because I, this is a part of the process for me that has evolved a lot over time. And it might be some writers are very locked into this part or others might discover like me, every time is different. <laughs> um, and, and so this past time I did a series of early revisions where I turned in 30 pages to a group of people that I cultivated from my author list mm-hmm. um, to read those 30 pages every two weeks, I think it was, and give me feedback. So because I had switched from writing paranormal romance that was kind of sweet and before that young adult adventure fantasy and here I was writing something new, I didn't know what I was writing. So I used this phase to kind of do what I could in terms of light edits, give it to them, start to get feedback as to what it was. And that was so cool. I really probably would do that again because it helped me shape it. It got early reader excitement. People got to be clued into the behind the scenes. Um, Some of these people already had seen some of my other work. And so I wanted to bring them with me, you know, into this new genre. And that um, also my father was sick and he was dying. And so it was a really great way to be editing, but lightly mm-hmm. and to have kind mm-hmm. of a process and a momentum and a structure with these other people waiting for the next batch of pages. So um, that really worked really, really well. And then when I switched into revisions um, for book one at the end of last year, yeah, I remember struggling with chapter one for like six weeks, just like I've been doing now. And here I am <laughs> book three and I'm like still, ah, and in the summer, I was struggling with the beginning of book two, and boy, that one was hard. Oh, wow. It's interesting. Each book is kind of harder, because I actually grew as a writer, and I actually made my mm-hmm. detective stories, my murder mysteries more complicated, more players, more... And because it's set in the future, I have to create things that I, I can't... That modern-day tech couldn't solve. Modern-day tech couldn't create the, the, the murder. Uh, in some cases, they could, but then... I have them hidden in ways that like modern day tech couldn't solve. So I have to come up with all these fun things. Otherwise, why make it <laughs> like a modern <laughs> murder? I have to be super inventive. It's fun. Um, and at the same time, I, I realize I, you know, I say jump this high. You know, I, I give myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. A lot going on there. <laughs> No, there no, no, is a lot going on. That's fa- back. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> we're, fabulous. That's why we listen carefully because we we like to drill <laughs> down even more. Next week on the StoryWorks Roundtable, we pick up where we left off in our conversation with Beth Barani when Robert asks how she developed this process of drafting series, working on multiple books at one time, and using her best beta readers while she is still in the drafting process. Thank you for listening to the StoryWorks Roundtable. Find all our shows, show notes, and videos at storyworkspodcast.com.